Okay, so welcome and good morning for this last class of the semester. Uh, as you know, next week we won't have any more lectures because if you remember in the first weeks we had an extra number of, lecture, uh, of classes at the beginning of the course. So I'm, we are not uh, imposing uh, too many hours to, on, to, onto you. Um, this week the lab uh, will be uh, still, uh, let's say, the, of the same type uh, as uh, the other weeks, uh, with one <coughs> uh, exception, one difference, uh, is that the text uh, of the assignment uh, and, uh, um, and the project on which you work uh, will be available through the same uh, GitHub Classroom mechanism that we, you will use during, we will use during the, during the exam. So you can start using the same mechanism that will be <coughs> mandatory for the exams. Uh, we did that so that you can familiar, familiarize yourself, uh, you know, get more confident with, the, with all the uh, Git, uh, GitHub Classroom procedure and also with submitting uh, um, the, 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 um, the exam hmm? at the end. Just, just a, uh, it's a, just a delivery method for, for giving you the, the, the project. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, we will upload that so that you can start, okay, providing your credential to the platform and so on. Next week, the, sim the lab hours will be different. Uh, you will not be split into two groups, so all the three hours for everybody. And it will be uh, one exam simulation. Of course, we cannot, it's not, like I say, possible to develop a full exam text uh, in three hours, of course. Uh, what uh, uh, Juan will do is will, will be to take uh, an, an actual exam from the last years and try to do the design together with you. Okay. So all together, we start from the the, um, the text of an exam and we start designing, uh, uh, thinking about the API and database and the API endpoints uh, and all the client side uh, about uh, the routes, the components, uh, the states, uh, and so on. So all the main you know, design decisions that, you know, take, take some time, take some, um, let's say, uh, back and forth uh, choices and alternatives, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and then we'll maybe we can start uh, writing some code or maybe see some solution that, or some partial solution from, from the last exam. But I think that the most important part is, uh, uh, is trying to reason together, starting from a full exercise, because we, up to now, we, uh, during the course, we already had two exercises, you know, one in the class and the other in the labs, uh, which is a bit more complex, uh, uh, but we saw them growing. Hmm? Uh, and so there are some, let's say, design decisions that we made uh, on, on our way, and some design decisions they maybe we would have made differently if we had the final, let's say, uh, text at the beginning, up front. Okay, uh, so that will be the, the goal of the next week. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, a, it's an experiment uh, because we didn't have this kind of, of uh, simulation last year. Uh, I think uh, it could be useful and so I would suggest you to try to, to be there mm -hmm. and also to collaborate. We try to do that, uh, let's say, also in an interactive way. Mm -hmm. Designing together one possible solution or uh, analyzing the alternative solution for a realistic exam text. After that, well, due, on the 6th of, uh, of June, there will be no lectures, but we will publish the text of the exam. Okay, so uh, at that point, uh, uh, let's try not to... Yes, uh, uh, the two days after, you will have a lot of questions about the exam. <laughs> And so maybe some time can be also used uh, for giving clarification, but mainly the clarification about the exam should, should, be, should happen on the Google Doc, okay? So let's not try to waste this opportunity for the exam. Of course, we cannot provide, uh, say, here in this um, lab uh, guidance about uh, the current exam. Hmm? The dates are, you know, they intersect in strange ways. Okay, so for today, Today we are talking about uh, authentication. Uh, I ask uh, you to forgive me because this class is a bit uh, a pain um, in, in the neck, let's say. Hmm? Um, 
uh, not because, well, because authentication and all, thing, uh, all things about security are complex, but also uh, we have to deal uh, with a lot of different layers. Any layers we'll see you know, from the information that we have in the database to the authentication to the password that the user writes on the website. And uh, uh, in many cases, uh, um, we will have to apply a solution by uh, just doing what we are told, okay? Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, in the rest of the course, we try always to, to reason about why we do things in a certain way. Uh, today, we'll have more or less to follow a, a guideline of, of, uh, of alternatives. Uh, otherwise, for motivating or understanding each of the points uh, would be really complex, and in some cases, uh, it, wouldn't be, it would be also be very clear. Um, I will come to, to this, uh, say, thought uh, later on in the different points. Mm -hmm. So let's try to, to be patient and one, uh, be one step at a time. Of course, what we'll try to do together today is uh, to migrate the, our application that can be right now accessed by anybody to something where the user needs to log in some way uh, in order to be able to, um, to access the, the information. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, every website should have some mechanism, okay, for recognizing authentic and authorizing some users. Uh, let's just uh, remind uh, the difference between two A words, uh, authentication and authorization. Okay? Uh, authentication is uh, verifying that you are who you say you are. Okay? Verifying the identity of user. And of course, verify is a it's a wavy you know, concept. Uh, uh, the, there are there's no on-off verification. There are different degrees of, of confidence in this kind of verification. Okay, unless come by, somebody comes to you and makes a, a blood test and DNA test and whatever, uh, if you don't have any twins, uh, uh, then uh, there's no real verification for that. Uh, for that. So we are using some approximate verification, and the simplest way, and also the most hateful way of doing that in websites, is having a couple of credentials, a username, a login name, that may be an ID or maybe an email address, and a password, okay? What you do with this information is just to check that in that moment, that person has the information uh, that allows the website to recognize him. Okay, or her. Then, with this information, the website applies different authorization policies. So, if you are Mr. A, then you are authorized to see these web pages, you are authorized to make these modifications, and so on. If you are Mr. B, you will be authorized to do something different. Okay? So, uh, authorizing a user uh, means uh, deciding which functionality of the website, uh, of the application in general, is applicable, is accessible for a given user, or normally a group of users with a given set of credentials. Um, authorization comes after the authentication. Authentication is something that happens uh, at the beginning, when you log in, basically. Authorization is something that happens always throughout all the execution of the application. After the authorization, after you are authenticated, every action you do must be authorized. So every action, every API, every route should start with an if. If you are logged in and you are, you are an authorized user for this functionality, let's do this. Otherwise, I will kick you out. All of the functionality. This is a bit heavy because it's pervasive. So on the server side, we'll try to do with middlewares that will apply automatically to all API endpoints, and uh, on the client side, uh, we could play with context or try to limit uh, um, our navigation. Um, the basic uh, rule about uh, all this stuff, uh, about authentication authorization, is uh, don't do it yourself. Okay, because there are a lot of special cases and corner cases and danger points and so on. 
that if you try to imagine, okay, let's try open the blackboard and write some uh, authentication scheme, <coughs> and then some authorization scheme for, uh, for our website, we will make uh, for sure a lot of security mistakes. Hmm? Um, because every naive solution, <laughs> so, uh, as much as possible, for this part that is critical, we should rely on proven solutions and pro possibly on libraries that implements this, implement these sort of proven solutions. So that we can, we can be, let's say, not surely protected, but fairly confident that we are not doing any, let's say, um, bad mistakes. So, uh, and this thought about doing the right thing doing the thing that experts suggest. So that's why in many cases we should say, okay, we do this way because the best practice tells me to, to do it in this way, or because the experts say in this way, or because the library is implemented in this way. Okay, so there's, there are reasons behind that, but maybe these reasons are in 20 or 30 years of hacking or intrusions or security and so on. Hmm? Uh, the problem is that uh, these kind of decisions should be made at all these layers. You see, up on the top, we have a user that very happily navigates my web pages and, of course, maybe needs to log in and log out. But at the bottom, we have HTTP APIs that do, that do something about uh, our database, and they should only allow this operation for the authorized users. And from, from the user database, we know that we have several layers already. Um, there are some database access. We have the routes on the server. We, are, uh, we have the server itself, so the HTTP part of the server. And then we have the client side, the browser itself, and the React application in JavaScript, and finally, the user actions. Now, each of these blocks uh, are a different piece of software with a different role with different configuration details that may help or not uh, the security of the system. Uh, I, in the server, I separated uh, the routes in different moments, for example, login, log out, uh, and in general uh, API calls because we need to do different things. Okay, most of the application will do with normal API calls on the server side. So uh, we're routes for the, the APIs and the database queries for the APIs, but um, some APIs are special. Some APIs are for creating credentials and for forgetting credentials, logging and logout on the back end, and of course it should be accessible also from the front end. So logging and logout are sort of transversal functionalities or features of our application that are mostly independent so the authentication is mostly independent from what the application is really doing. The authorization, on the other hand, is very, could be fine-grained and depending on the application and the type of users that we have. Uh, the fact that the authentication is uh, independent from the application, mostly, makes it more reusable, okay? So it's a matter of cutting and pasting in the right place, the right thing, pieces in the right places, okay? So today we try to de develop some of these pieces and they are also in the, uh, in the slides, basically. So, um, there are in this slide some <coughs> concepts also, the concept of sessions, the concept of cookie, uh, and so on, that we still haven't seen here because we didn't need them. For single page applications, there's no navigation session, HTTP session up to now, so we need to introduce them in a very specific way hmm, uh, related to the uh, author, um, authorization mechanism. So basically, the, um, the first point is uh, trying to fight against one of the design choices of, a, of the HTTP protocol that dates back something like maybe 40 years or nearly, uh, no, a bit less. Um, the HTTP protocol has always been a stateless protocol, and it still is a stateless protocol, okay? This means that uh, every time I make an HTTP call, the server doesn't know 
whether this call is coming from a new client or from the same client that just made an, another HTTP call one second ago or one millisecond ago. Every HTTP request is independent from the others. They don't carry information from one to the other. And this is fine because it makes this protocol simpler. It makes it easy to scale because you just uh, you can just uh, you know uh, split the load in many web servers, and each one each of them just have to reply to a single HTTP request uh, without knowing what the other requests were or will be in the future. Okay, but at this point uh, we have a problem because if we are if we are logging into a website, in a way, the website should remember that I have logged in. Should distinguish me from another user who also logged in and should distinguish both of us from a third user who didn't log in yet. So every time I make an HTTP request and imagine the HTTP, the API, okay, I'm making a get uh, or a, in our example, a post uh, or I say a delete. Hmm? I'm deleting an answer. Probably I should only be able to delete my only answer. So the website implementing this API, delete answers ID, should check whether this ID corresponds to my, or to an answer that has been posted by the same user. Okay? Uh, and so the implementation of the API should have a mechanism for remembering who is the current user issuing this API call. And uh, this requires the web server to, in some way, remember that that specific user had a successful login some time ago. One second ago, 20 minutes ago, or something like that. So when a serving one, so I, I must add some memory to HTTP in, in a way. So that this HTTP call is no longer one of the many, but it's linked to a previous one that gave the user authorization uh, to enter the website. Uh, of course, this is a long-standing issue, and that's being solved in version 1.1 of HTTP, back in the times. It was released in very shortly after version 1.0, uh, with the, the creation of the concept of a session. A session is, uh, let's say, in abstract terms, uh, is a container of data that is remembered across different calls. And uh, this data is, depending on how you use it, how you use it uh, may be managed by the server or may be shared between the server and the client, in a way. Hmm? And uh, it's uh, implemented by exchanging messages between the server and the client. Uh, any session cannot just be implemented on the server alone. It needs the help of the client. Why? Because the server is an HTTP server, and so by design it doesn't have any memory. So you cannot reconstruct uh, session information, so the continuity of uh, operation by a single user, only on the server side. You need, we need some help from the client side. What's make, uh, what makes my login different than yours? Well, that after the login, I'm still using the same browser on the same computer. So basically, the server, what the server could do is to identify the browser I'm actually using in this moment. That specific piece of software running on my computer. In fact, if you are opening or closing this browser and open another one, the session will be gone. You need to log in again. Okay, so, the session is linked to a user using a specific browser in a point in time. And this specific browser is what makes my session unique compared to yours. So uh, the server can reconstruct all the information as long as it can identify uniquely and without error the browser that I'm using in this moment. Of course, there, I not, don't want to be you know, controlled and uh, know exactly 
what is the browser no I, we don't have fingerprints on the browsers so that they are installed with a different id it's a, a temporary identity that is created during login and the browser should help the server say okay hello it's me again hmm? um, one of the parts is keeps say, the state of implication usually it's the server huh? the server remembers some information about the current session um, through a simple let's say mapping mechanism of a usually it's a cryptographic cryptographically secure session id a session id is just a number or a string as random as possible okay and uh, uh, is used to identify a specific session so a specific user user navigating the site the website among all the possible users that are currently active on that website so imagine that we are connecting you are connected to the website you entered the login information and at the moment a session id is created for you which is different from any other session ids and is difficult to guess everybody that's the session id is a passport everybody with that specific essential id can use the website and pretend to be you okay um, so the server can generate an id upon login okay you are number one two three four five okay and this number is given to the browser saying dear browser if you want to be recognized in your future requests as a part of the same session please provide me this number over and over again okay so there's a game i play usually when i try to think about these kind of issues uh, imagine and you are not too far from the truth that i'm a very uh, a person that has a very very short memory okay nearly zero so imagine a conversation with a person with me that who have has uh, no memory huh? we shake hands i am fulvio hi i'm paolo and whatever and uh, on the next sentence i already forgot about you i don't know who you are anymore and so how can we have a conversation so my trick, my trick is to take notes. Okay, so when I shake hands with somebody, I write on a small piece of paper, this is Paolo. Okay? And uh, every further piece of information, I add that. If it's relevant, I write it down. If it's not relevant, I can, I'm happy to forget it. Okay, so there's a minimum set of data that constitutes the specificity of that session so but i cannot take this um let's say notes in my pockets because maybe I, maybe I have a conversation with 30 person at a time i am i'm a web server after all and so we have 30 notes and when somebody's telling me something i know that one of them it should be one of them but i know, don't know which one right so having all this session information is useful only if i can map the same information to this to the correct person so what do i do of course i cannot give you that would be easy i can give you the notes okay you talk to me i write something on the notes and give it to you and then on the next iteration you give my notes back to me i read i reconstruct our interaction our history i i reply in a sensible way because i reconstructed the history and then i give you the updated notes this would work this could work basically i'm i don't trust my memory i am trusting you to store my memories you the client of course this cannot work in this way because uh, uh, you could provide me with fake information 
if these notes are I owe you ten dollars you can correct it and say okay I only owe you owe you one dollar and I have no way of checking that because I trust in the information which is there so I have to solve two problems one being able to identify which is which about my uh, clients and second not letting the clients see my information or even worse modify my information the solution is in is in the session ID I attach to every note leaflet one random number and I'm giving you something which is only the number so when you come back to me the only information you have is the number the session number the session ID and with this number I can find the ticket among my notes and they can reply sensibly and can update the information about the session never leaves the server so I'm entrusting the browser to remember the number the ID of the session the browser cannot play tricks on the client side because if you change the session ID it will no longer match any of the current sessions if these numbers are unguessable they are random enough so that you cannot guess the number corresponding to another user if I don't leak it in any way and uh, you cannot modify the data because the data is still in the server so this is the mechanism in a very convoluted one okay that allows the HTTP server to have a memory of the interactions a state on the server uh, we already talked a lot about the state on the client in react now we are putting some state also on the server basically <coughs> for remembering whether the user is logged in or not <coughs> we need to create this state abstraction in the server on top of a protocol that doesn't have any state notion and we do that with the help of the client okay um, the cookies are the mechanism used by HTTP for implementing this kind of exchange of information okay the cookie were, were a nice thing before the European Union came back with all the regulations about the cookie banners and all this but they are still useful okay so the what is a cookie It's just a string of text a portion of text that can be added as a um, header in either HTTP requests or responses which a name and a value so we can the usually the cookie is something that the server creates and puts in a response so I connect to a server in the HTTP response I have an extra header called set cookie and this set cookie can set a value to a given name the browser receives this cookie stores it internally in the browser with the promise that on every following calls from the same browser to the same server the browser will give back the same identical cookie to the server the mechanism that we saw before okay of course only to the same exact server that delivered that I cannot uh, no, it would be uh, bad to give the, a cookie to a server different from the one uh, that created but in any case the cookie it, uh, goes to the client and is stored inside the browser so it should not never contain information real information let's say because the clients are not trust cannot be trusted okay any br no browser can be trusted no user can be trusted they can always open the inspector and see all the data all the information that is there so never store information inside the cookie except some let's say cryptographically useless information that is not useful to anyone in the world except the website that created that hmm? and it cannot be reverse engineered in, in any way and so on so we will use the cookie for transmitting the minimum amount of information for the server to be able to recognize me for handling cookies we don't need to do anything the browser already knows how to do that it's uh, built in into the browsers when I receive a cookie I will send it back to every following call to the same server it's automatic okay. so for example we could set a cookie 
with a name uh, session ID and a strange random sequence on the server after the login of the user. And so on every a a API call, okay, the browser will automatically attach to the request. I don't need to put it in my fetch call. It will be automatically appended by the browser a copy of the cookie and the server will receive an HTTP API from which it can extract the cookie and from the cookie can reach all the information that they have in the nodes. Hmm? There are a couple of, op of options about cookies. When you set a cookie of a name and value are the key information. Uh, it, you can have a, a secure flag, true or false. That means that whether this cookie is only acceptable over HTTPS we are not doing TTPS here because we don't want to spend the night uh, fighting about certificates, so we cannot use this, but it would be a good idea to use it in a real web server. Don't expose cookie to HTTP connection, only to HTTPS connection, so they cannot be intercepted in the way by, in the middle of transit uh, by routers, by many in the middle attacks and so on. But okay, it's beyond what we can do in this, for, uh, in this course. And uh, this is interesting and we are using it, HTTP only is an option where the cookie is invisible to JavaScript. Normally, I say that the cookie is part of the HTTP response. So the response headers can be queried by JavaScript. In the response dot headers, <laughs> easily, hmm? and on the client side after a fetch. Uh, if the cookie is set to be HTTP only, well, it's, it's deleted from the information that goes to the JavaScript code. So JavaScript will never be able to see even this stupid information. So it cannot leak it in a way for programmers' mistakes. Of course, the browser will see it. So if I'm taking a browser and modify the browser and I'm tweaking the code of the browser, I can, this is not a real protection. Uh, uh, not to protect JavaScript security, more about against uh, programming errors uh, in the JavaScript code. We don't need the JavaScript to see this number. The, the client side has no purpose of knowing this number. It wouldn't know what to do. Okay? The only purpose of this number is to be sent back to the, to the server, but the browser is already doing that. We don't need to in involve our JavaScript code. So it's better to hide it from the JavaScript code. And the expiration date is basically the duration of the session or your session. You remember when uh, on a website, uh, the website will tell you you, are being, you have been inactive for too long, you need to log in again. What happened is that the cookie expired. So when you click somewhere, the browser will send an HTTP request without the cookie. Because the old one was expired, the, the, um, the browser can't send it anymore, and the server will see a request for an authenticated and a page that needs auto authorization from a user which is no longer authenticated. And so we'll ask you to authenticate again. Hmm? Okay, so the game with cookie is summarized in this uh, picture. This is our notes, okay, where I'm writing some information. Linked to a session ID, I can store some information about the username, the information, the other data, whatever I need to store about this specific interaction. It's stored in the server hid them from the rest of the world. Linked and accessible only if I know the session ID. And only, of course, if the session ID hasn't expired yet. When you log in in the browser, imagine your React component uh, with a small login form, they will send a sort of a post call, providing username and password that the user duly wrote uh, in their text fields. So the browser is issuing a fetch call with a POST method to the server to a specific API, the login API. This login API will create a session, an empty session storage. So we create, oh, okay, sorry. We have to check whether this username and password are correct. If the user provided me the right password. If not, well, the call will fail. If yes, then we, are, we have established a new session, a new authenticated session. And so we can create some session 
ID, session information, session data about the information, and in the response, it will be a simple OK response with the session ID. Stored in a cookie, which is invisible by the JavaScript. And this happens once at login time, and in the rest of the time, for the future, for all other calls, I put a get, by example, any get and post and put it you afterwards, the browser will automatically append the cookie to the request itself. The server extracts this cookie, extracts the session ID number from the cookie, checks whether the session ID number is valid, if it's, if it's actually in the list of the, uh, of the active sessions, and if yes, it will load all this data. This data, retrieve store session data, for that specific session means that specific user, and then we can use this information to do other queries, or to do our work, and so on, to check whether it's valid, and so on. Okay? So we are, there's a storage, this storage is normally managed by an extension of the web server, so we don't need to do it ourselves. We, what we have in our code is that we have access, automatic access to this data. We can store and retrieve them. We know that the server is serving many users at the same time, but in our API implementation, we only have the data about one single user because it has been extracted and decoded according to the session ID. So it's all basically transparent to us. It relies on this mechanism, but on the browser side, it's all automatic. On the server side, it's all managed by a middleware, basically. We should be aware that we are, when we are writing something into a session storage, we are saving something on the server in a protected way. Hmm? OK, and then we have the response and so on. So everything should be done on analyzing the, the request, whether we have all the information. And here, we check the authorization. I know who you are because the session tells me your username, and so I know whether you are allowed or not to get this list of information. Okay, um, so this seems a, it's, it's a complex mechanism, but it seems simple until you start thinking about the type of attacks that you can mount on this kind of mechanism. We are not going into that. Just know that there are some scary acronyms, acronyms around the world that tell you there are very bad things that can be done or can happen to you if you are not managing correctly uh, all of these uh, uh, sessions and cookies and so on. Hmm? So let's go to a more practical view. This is the foundation on which the session is built. <clears throat> we still haven't see, seen uh, how to uh, Authorize, authenticate the user. Let's start from the beginning. A user fills a form in the client uh, with a user ID and password. That's easy. It's just a form, nothing special. The client, uh, React component, validates this data if the login is uh, not empty and so on. And uh, if it's okay, I call the post uh, login. I call a remote API. The server receives the request and checks whether the user is already registered and the password matches. So when I do a login, the server will check, okay, we have a, the server will receive uh, possibly over an encrypted connection, HTTPS. We don't have this. Uh, right now we have a very sensitive point. If anybody is reading this post, it will receive in clear the username and the password. Bad. Okay. To make it better, we need more complex mechanisms. We don't have time. Uh, you need, uh, let's say, some uh, cha challenge authentication, something more complex. But so let's try to do the minimum uh, to, to, to get started. I'm sending username and password. The, the uh, server will check whether the username is valid or not. 
it may exist or not, and if it exists, whether the password matches or not. Of course, uh, comparing the password uh, should be done in a way where the passwords are never stored in the server. So we'll see some trick about uh, hashes uh, to be able to check whether a password is valid without storing the password at all, uh, at all times. Okay, if uh, it's wrong, uh, we have an error, otherwise uh, the session is started and the server generates a session ID and it can store these in, okay, in the session storage. Points five and six are basically automatic, handled by the server. Uh, and we reply by creating a cookie. We want to create it with, the, with this option, okay? Now the browser will receive the cookie and store it in the browser. And uh, from this moment, the session is, uh, is valid. Okay, so uh, from the point of view of the, of the code, we just have a, let's say, the, the client does nothing special. The client only makes uh, a call with the username and password that collected from a state of a form. And uh, after the callback, uh, it will navigate to an, uh, an internal web page or to navigate to an error page, for example. Okay, so the client does nothing special. It's like, like any other API call. And the handling of the cookie is invisible to our code. Hmm? So that's easy. The worker is on the server side. Most of the burden of authentication is on the server side which is reasonable because the server is the, the point that we want to protect. It's not the browser. Browsers come and go. And for implementing all these best practices you know, of security, we need to do something on the server side, on Express, that will help us to validate and check and so on all this work. And in the JavaScript world, there is a library called Passport which is here, uh, that already implements uh, a lot of uh, uh, authentication methods. No? What, what the password uh, authors say that they implement more than 500 strategies. A strategy is a different mechanism for doing authentication. And uh, for example, uh, you can authenticate through Google, or through OpenID, or through Facebook, uh, or uh, through a local username and password stored in a database, and this is the way we go, with the simplest one, uh, with the JWD token, uh, with the OAuth 2, which is the most secure mechanism, but it's also complex to, to set up, uh, and uh, some for authenticating against uh, a given directory, with an exchange of, X of, of XML fi files, uh, and so on, you can, on Microsoft. So depending on what kind of uh, um, login mechanism you want to implement in your website, uh, there are different plugins, different, they call them strategies, into this password library that implement the basic uh, interaction with the data structure or with the external services. Each of them, of course, will be managed in a separate way, but uh, uh, they have some common uh, uh, basically common mechanism, okay? So it's, ve it's a very rich library that can give you, let's say, a wide range of options with, uh, well, not much documentation. This one is the one of the worst documented websites that we have in the JavaScript uh, world. Really, it's... Uh, it's something that is really difficult to understand uh, because the information is scattered around. Uh, there are no e examples in the guide. So we try to create our slides in a guided way because just saying, read the documentation, it will be a disaster for all of us. Hmm? Um, and there are, there are some oh, very limited uh, customization options in many cases. So sometimes I will be saying, this variable must have this name because the library expects this 
to have this name and you cannot change it mm -hmm. and not always it's very well, it's, it's really documented that that is a constant or ca whether it can be customized or not so uh, it helps us uh, with a lot of work uh, but we must uh, bend uh, to what they want to do the, ha the, the way this library wants to work okay so uh, it's uh, of course uh, it's a compromise that we have to make Uh, the good point is that the implementation of these plugins already tries to implement uh, all the best practices so we don't have to set all the details of the protocol level because the library is already doing that for us so how to modify our server by adding some let's say, authentication library that we will then configure uh, choose and set up which authentication strategy to adopt so what where oh where are your passwords validated? In a local database, on Google, on a open OAuth, open authentication server, where? So this is the first point. For us, uh, will be a local strategy. Mm -hmm. So we, our passwords are local, are stored into our database. Then we'll see how to store them to be more secure. Then we need to add all the middleware that we need, and basically we need a middleware for sessions for handling sessions because right now express doesn't handle sessions we need to add a middleware for that a middleware for passport and a middleware for, a middleware for the strategy local strategy password local strategy you know, which is the plugin of, of password and then the third point is uh, uh, which information is stored in the local uh, session data a lot of information is in the database on the server you can get a query and have the information ready but uh, the key information about the identification of the user maybe the ID the name or, or something like that must be stored in local session data so that it would be quick for uh, our code to know which user is, uh, is, cur is currently logged in hmm? so uh, local strategy is a strategy that we use to authenticate the users and you see that we have here password.user we are registering a middleware in express so we are on the server side okay we are registering a middleware that implements this local strategy so it provides already methods for the password library to check passwords against uh, a local database okay uh, you see that we are loading both passport which is the general library and password local so they should be installed and then we will load them here um, the local strategy that we create express um, a function as a parameter which is the function that Passport will use every time it needs to check a user, to verify a user. It will receive a username, a passport, a password, and we call a callback function to return the results of the authentication. So this verify function is a function that we write and password calls we write this function and in this function we receive a username and a passport uh, password we need to do our checks with the database only us know how we store the information in our DB it cannot be automated we do the query and then the query can be okay or not and according to okay or not we call the callback this is a sort of a resolving the promise or so calling an, an asynchronous callback by telling okay the authentication failed or the authentication succeeded with a very strange convention that we'll show in the next slide okay so this verify function remember here we are at the beginning of the code of the page we are password.use we are configuring middlewares and in configuring this specific middleware we provide one function that will be called later on 
when password is trying to uh, validate the login. We are just providing the function. We are providing a callback that receives username and password and concludes with calling itself another callback. Okay. Um, the callback function that should be the closing instruction, I'll say, in our code after we check the uh, maybe with the database, the username and password are correct, and so on. As a very strange convention, usually you, can, you, call, you call this callback with two parameters, maybe three, maybe one. If you have two parameters, the first one is null. Now, the uh, passing null at the first parameter means uh, no error. We don't have any error. Meaning that uh, we don't have any failed query, we don't have any connection error, and so on. But the authentication may have been successful or not. If the authentication has not been successful, successful the second parameter, the second argument will be false. If it has been successful, we return uh, the second argument will be an object containing user information. The structure of this object is up to us. We can decide the, the user.id, user.name, user.last name, whatever. Okay? So, we do the query in the database. Uh, I made, for example, I made a get user API. API, at the, sorry, at the database level, not at the HTTP level. And the I extract, I'm doing some select from, and so on, some about information about the user. If the information is correct, then I return, I return by calling a callback. Null, no error, user. These are the information about the user. This information is stored in the local session storage on the server. Doesn't go to the, to the client, okay? If there are some problems with the API, maybe the password is wrong, I am calling the callback with null, false, and the motivation. And this message can be used later on to build a response. Just remember the uh, error message should never tell you whether the username is wrong or the password is wrong. You should always be agnostic about that. Maybe I try to log in with a username that doesn't exist. It's a, it's a mistake if the error message is username doesn't exist. We shouldn't give a means to users to guess, try and guess which username are registered. Of course, that seems obvious, but uh, so we, we don't, we must not be too specific in our error message. Some, something went wrong with your authentication information. That will drive the user's crisis, of course, but it's for their protection. Users hate this. Developers too. Um, okay, so these are the different ways in which uh, verification of the identity can finish. With some generic error, maybe database connection, whatever, with authentication error, null false, with a good authentication, null user object. This, um, this verify function is called, we say, with two parameters, username and password. And this comes with the hard part. No, not the only hard part, but uh, the strange part. How can pass passport the library know about uh, which, are the, which is the username and password that we just sent over the, the form, the POST API. Well, it's written here. The username and pass password, which are the parameter that we receive in our verification function, are automatically extracted from request.body.username and request.body.password. So this means that in our post call, we must 
because the only way in which passport will extract them, we must pass an object in the post request body with a field called username and another called password. Not user and pass, username and password in the post body. We cannot use any other mechanism. Okay? In this case, these two parameters are extracted automatically and passed to the verification function. They can be encoded into JSON, if the JSON middleware is loaded so it can parse the body, or in uh, form data, in a form mechanism, uh, but we don't use it, but the browser would, would, uh, would choose uh, that kind of encoding. So the first problem is to debug whether the data is coming to the server, and then validating it. Um, okay, so let's try this first pass uh, in our code, okay? Um, no, not yet, no, sorry, not yet, because we are still missing one step, sorry. We need to put the, to have a, a, several information put together. Um, Let's skip to step number two and then go back to the password encryption later. So this is just the validation function. The passport, uh, this verification function is used when you click on the login, but, uh, the login button, right? And then we saw that after that we need to create a session. And the session, step number two, is created automatically if uh, you use uh, a middleware for handling sessions. So there's another middleware called Express Session that uh, we can use to okay, uh, enable our application <coughs> to store session information. There are some uh, uh, options to this session, and uh, the first option is, uh, sorry, we have an option object, and one of the properties of this option is uh, secret. What is secret is, uh, secret, any kind of random number or sentence that is used internally by the server to encrypt the session itself. Okay, so also the session data, even if the session data never leaves the server, it's protected by this uh, encryption key, hmm? in a way. And this encryption key is always used for generating and signing the cookies. Okay, so if anybody in the world could guess your secret key, it could try to decode or validate or regenerate a cookie ID with the same signature, which is not good. So ideally, this should be uh, secret as much as something it, which is committed on GitHub <laughs> can be, um, and different, okay? Where is this uh, session information stored? Well, Express Session by default stores this information in memory. So all these nodes, all the session data, is just stored in memory in the running process, uh, the running Express uh, uh, process. Which is of course not scalable if we have many uh, sessions, many users. It's a, it's a good choice for development because it requires zero configuration. But uh, in production, no, probably you must, you want to store the information somewhere, say, less, more scalable, okay? That allows for more, for a larger number of session, uh, concurrent session. And uh, it's, it's, of course, it's supported by the Express Session middleware, but you need to configure it. So, for example, you can store the session information in a database table. You need to provide all the database credentials and so on to the uh, Express Session middleware or it can be stored in a file, in a directory, or in a shared memory location. There are many extensions for that. If you want, the Express Session is quite, let's say, reasonably well documented. So, um, but without any further configuration, the data is already stored and is stored in memory. Hmm? The only, and it's also faster, but it's less scalable. When you create a session, you say the, the secret is used to sign the, uh, the cookie. So it's better if it's uh, different from each of you, each of our projects. How, where to store by default this memory. Uh, this is a deprecated uh, 
uh, options, so we, uh, we shouldn't care about all, all these other options. The default values uh, are, usually, are usually okay. Hmm? Okay, so with this middleware, sessions are automatically generated at each request. Having a session doesn't mean that you, have you are authenticated. It only means that you have a session ID. Then we want, and so, a local session storage. Once you are authenticated, you will put into that local session storage some information. Uh, this is not of no concern to the session mechanism. The session just opens and creates and manages the storage, but it's passport. We are again on passport here. That uh, knows uh, or needs to know which information is relevant for a user. Okay, so uh, we saw uh, passport uh, calls the verify function. The verify function is telling me this user is okay. And so Passport will store information about the user in the session. And every time so I, I log in, the information about the user is stored in the session. Every time a new API call comes in, a new get comes in, Passport needs to retrieve from the session the information about the currently logged in user. So Passport receives the session ID, goes to the session storage, extracts the information about the user from the session storage, and makes it available to the programmer. And every time I modify some information about the user, Passport needs to store it back to the session storage. So what is happening here is that we don't need to manage session storage by ourselves. It would not be basically just session dot something in our code, but the information about the authentication is in the session is managed automatically by Passport. And for doing that, Passport needs two methods to be defined. One is a method for serializing and the other for deserializing user information. So basically, Passport doesn't care about other information, only user information, login information. That's its job. So serialized, serialized and deserialized uh, and of course we need to provide a callback function with one parameter which is the user and uh, one parameter, uh, second parameter which is a callback uh, that is used to asynchronously return the result. Uh, it's all asynchronous here, all made with callbacks. Um, so we need to, to call the callback with the same convention. First parameter is uh, null if everything was okay or error. And second parameter is the uh, object. So we need to create an object uh, that describes, that decides, also, for example, the user object may have many fields, uh, and we, only, we want to store only some of them, ID, mail, and name, for example. And so this is the serialized user used to serialize an object, the current user information that comes from the database call, into the session. And this serialized goes the other way. Hmm? Uh, if we are <clears throat> one choice that we may do is uh, to store in the session exactly the same information that we have from the database. And so, for example, deserialization is a null operation. We just give the same object as back. But we could, in general here, transform, do any kind of transformations. Hmm? Um, so serialized user can store the full object or a subset of the object, the user object. And this information is stored into a session variable called passport. And we don't need to care about this, this session does passport variable, okay? And the deserializer 
extract the same info, uh, the same inf information from the session and puts it back uh, into the session. The interesting part uh, is the last line here that the information that is extracted by password from the session only in case all the verification succeed is automatically put into a variable a property of the request so the nice part of this is that once we set up all the callbacks uh, we don't need to be aware of passport or of the session what we will have is that in our request object we have request.params, we have, we have request.user. It's a new property that if everything is successful, is automatically populated with the object corresponding to the currently logged in user. So it's hard to, <laughs> to set up, but then it's easy to implement, to, to use, sorry, not implement. So at the beginning of every API call, we just extract request.user and we have all the information about the currently logged in user. We don't need to do any session extraction, any database call, anything else. Any cookie extraction or whatever. We have this object and you can modify it. Usually we don't modify the user information during a session, but, and, um, okay, so the hard part is setting up these uh, uh, callbacks, and, uh, but then at the end we have just, you, and we remember, this uh, another important security rule. Every time we need to know who is the currently logged in user, we must check request.user. Because it gives me the information only if everything is correct from the security point of view. As a corollary, never send the user information in a, an API call. Or if you send it, don't trust it. Let's say another way, if I add the post for adding a new answer, the author of that answer should not, should not be a part of the post. Because the server already knows who is the author. The author is the currently logged in user. If I include the author in the post, like we did up to today, then I'm implying that I can post a new answer with your name. Okay, so the information about the user should come from the authentication, not from the data. Data cannot be trusted. Okay, so remember whenever we have some API in which you need to provide information about the current user, remember that the, this information is already known by the server. You don't need to provide it. Unless you want a user to act on behalf of another user. But this is just for administrators that maybe have separate authorization, separate set of APIs. Okay, so we are nearly ready. We have set up everything. We have set up the session, the serialization, so the password strategy, the session itself, and the link between the strategy and the session. Serialize and deserialize. Now, the library is set up. How, we, how do we use it? We use it in different ways in two different moments, at login and after login. At login, we have a middleware called Authenticate that will exploit the strategy that we defined before. So we define a, a normal API for the login operation. And uh, this middleware calls our verify function. So what the middleware is doing is to extract uh, username and password from the post body. We'll uh, call verify with that username and password, password. 
The verify function that we wrote does all the checks with the database, all the queries to check whether a password is actually correct with respect to that specific user, and finally calls the callback. Null user object. If all of this goes well, then the request is processed. And the callback is called if authentication is successful. And now at this point, request.user contains the authenticated user. It comes from the database query and has been stored in the session, deserialized from the session, and stored into request. So you see that in this code here, we have no notion of, of cookies or sessions. They are there because we set up, we set up everything, but during the code, it's very easy. Local, look for a username field and a password field in request of body with those exact names. And we must be able to parse the body according to the JSON format. So set up all the headers correctly. This is the point where our verify function, the only point where our verify function is called. Um, and on the, after the login, we need to say protect or to ensure that some APIs uh, can be protected, so cannot be called unless the user is, is currently logged in. So maybe we have some, I don't know, uh, get questions, it can be a public API. Anybody can get that. But other question or vote and answer should be authenticated. So of course the user interface should not show me actions that they're not authorized to do. But JavaScript is JavaScript on the client, so anybody can open the console and write fetch something. So we need to protect all the APIs from being called by a user which is not authorized to do that action. And so, we, sorry, uh, we, I will go back. We, I will skip some, some details and will, we will need to go back to those, but uh, just to keep the flow. We have a second middleware, or medically, yeah, it's, it's password itself, which inject another function into the request. You know, request.user, but also we have a function called request is is authenticated, which is a function that will tell me whether the current user, according to the session information, is authenticated or not. So this can be used at the beginning of every uh, call. If the request is authenticated, then do something, otherwise uh, send an error. So the API call will stop, sorry, the authentication will stop the execution of the API call. And a good suggestion is to create a small middleware that calls is authenticated, and if it's okay, then return next or goes to the request, otherwise it generates the error itself uh, without even processing the request. And this uh, middleware can be added to all the APIs that we want to protect. We just specify the middleware here, and then all those calls are protected. Or we use the uh, app.use with the middleware, so we register the middleware, so all the API from that point below will be protected. Okay, so the bottom line is during logging, we use this on the other APIs, we use this. We have two small middlewares that are used in strategic points. Uh, okay. I skipped two details to make it work. The problem is that until we have all the information, we can do the yellow, the yellow word. Um, one problem is of all this mechanism is that we are using it in a strange way. Cookies were invented for a website client, so uh, yeah, for a client application website to 
exchange information or to maintain a session with the server that created this application. But remember that we have two servers. Our application comes from, from the React server, but the API call go to the Express server. So we already enabled the course last week or so, or two weeks ago, to be able to make API calls to a different server. But we need to, to enforce this uh, authorization by saying, not only allow me to do some post calls, but also send the cookies, accept and send the cookies. So usually when I have a website coming from an origin, the React server, it will not accept, the browser will not accept cookie, cookies coming from different origins. Not to pollute its cookies or have some no, uh, problem of sec other security problems. So we need to authorize the exchange of credentials, meaning the cookie information, between our client application with an origin of React uh, to the other server that is uh, on a different origin. And this should be configured both on the client side and on the server side. On the server side, when we set up course, we should specify the origin. By the way, this is wrong, it's not 3000, it should be 5103, which is the origin of React, sorry. Credential true. So I am a server, I will accept the credentials, the cookie, coming from a JavaScript with a different origin than mine. And on the client side, so we are on the fetch, we should also tell the fetch to also include the cookies that have been accepted from that website, from that other origin. Okay, so we must configure the course to accept those uh, cookies. Um, all the fetch requests to protected APIs must include uh, this option, credential include. So in all our APIs, we need to uh, add this option. Even in the gets, uh, get APIs that up to now didn't have any option, we must add an option object. All of them that are protected. So these credentials include, uh, is checked by this credential through on the server, and it allows the is authenticated method to work. Otherwise, uh, the server will not find anything in the cookies and so will uh, reject the, the session. There's an, an exception to this. The login API is not protected, of course. When I log in, I'm not yet logged in. So it should be an open API. But also in this case, even if it's not protected, we must include credential include in the login post call, because otherwise the browser will not store the received cookie. So during the login, I'm not sending any cookie, but uh, the response of the post will have the cookie inside. And so the browser should be authorized, uh, instructed to store this cookie. So this credential include should be in all, called in all, should be included in all calls to protected APIs and the login API. If you want, just include it everywhere. It doesn't hurt. Okay, so there's one last step, which is uh, the most boring one, uh, storing password in the server. So the verify function receives in clear text uh, the username and the password. We, should, we must not store username and password, or oh, uh, the password in clear in our database because otherwise everyone who steals our database will get in clear all the passwords. So we have a mechanism, we need, must have a mechanism for um, storing some information that will allow, allow us to check whether a password is correct without storing the password itself. So what we are doing is 
to store in the database a hash of the password with a hashing function that starting from our password creates a, a nice set of uh, digits. 32 hexadecimal digits, for example, okay? 32 bytes, sorry, it's 64 digits. And we store this into the database. So when I register, a new, I create a new user, when they sign up, when they register to the new website, they provide the password. You take this password, on the server, you create a hash code for that, and store the hash code in the database. Returning from this hash code to the data to the password is not possible. Inverting this hash function, function is not possible. The only reason, so even if somebody steals your database, they will find also these numbers, just these numbers. Uh, we don't use only hashing because it would be too easy to, uh, for example, if I only use a hashing function and my password is the same as yours, the two hashes will be identical. So uh, I, cannot, I, I could download the hashes and try to compute the hashes on many different passwords until by chance I find a password that matches one of the hashes. So I can, in a way, <coughs> work offline with a copy of the passwords and, uh, uh, and try to guess them. If I have two users with the same password, the, the hashes will be the same, which is not good, especially because some passwords are used more often than others. So what we are using as a normal mechanism, as a best practice, I, would, well, I wouldn't call it best practice, the minimum practice is, uh, yes, I call a hashing function, but with a so-called so, uh, so seed function, seed value. Uh, a salt, sorry, salt or seed value. So there's a, a, a method here, as a, so in Node, we already have a, a module called Crypto. It's already pre-installed, you don't need to install it, just require it, which is a function as script that takes a password and returns a hash password. Returns in an asynchronous way, so through a callback. There's also a synchronous version of that, a script sync, if you want to avoid the callback. And uh, in addition to the password, it also takes a, sal a salt. Basically, what it does is to concatenate, uh, it's not really like that, but imagine you, uh, you concatenate the salt with the actual password and it will hash everything. So even two identical passwords with a different salt will be hashed to a different hashes. And the salt, so it's a, some, just a random number that we put in front. So the hashes will be less recognizable and you cannot just guess one password to guess all of them, all the identical ones, but you need to guess each of, each of them separately because each of them will have a different salt. And so it will become, it will uh, create the brute force attack more uh, demanding. And so these are the, the mechanisms for creating um, a password. And for checking the password, there's an equal method that takes two hashes and compares them. So, what are we doing in our server? In our server, we are receiving username and password in clear. In the database, we have the salt and the hash for all the users. Let's see. Um, we have the password. We query the database. We retrieve the salt. For the, you have the username, so we know which username we need to check. We check the username. For example, I created here a table called user. Uh, no, 
with a couple of users, so let me resize it. With te two test users, it's, it's on, uh, on the GitHub. So a user table with a list of my users. One ID, an email, a password, and a salt. Password is actually the hash of the password. So if I provide, uh, what, what should the verify function do? Okay, Fulvio is the username. So I will read from the database this row. First of all, I will check whether the username is correct. So I will filter one of these rows. If none exists, okay, login is, fa is failed. Otherwise, I will get the hash and the real, real, clear text password that came from the user. I'm using this salt with the, um, the real, the clear password to compute the hash. And then I compare the hash that I just recomputed with the hash that has been stored. These two fields uh, are created when I register a new, user, a new user. And then at login time, I will recompute the, 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 the password, the hashed password, with the salt from the database and the password from the user. I put them together, I compute the hash, and, and I compare the hashes. Salt and password never leave the server, are always on the server. Okay? It would be a mistake to accept an hashed value from the client because that can be compromised in a million of ways. Um, so practically, I, I made a, a very simple example to show how, how it works, okay? So let's imagine that I, I for this user, I extracted from the database the salt and the hash of the database. So database hash is uh, the hash password that was stored at login at uh, user uh, sign up, at user registration. And the user is telling me that the password is secret. The actual password is secret. So the verify function, of course, these, these two information come from the database. This comes from the request.body.password. The actual checking code is here. Uh, first of all, we encrypt this password with this salt. So we use encrypt. So this encryption is done twice. One, when registered to create the initial salt, uh, the initial hash, and then at every login to check this new password that can be wrong. So we encrypt this password with the salt coming from the database to a given length. We chose 32 bytes uh, for this case, okay? And the callback, well, may have an error, I didn't check it to, to make the, the, the code short. And this computed hash. So computed hash is a hash code recomputed from this salt and this secret. It can be right or wrong. If it's wrong, it's because the password is incorrect. And so in the callback, I need to con uh, check to compare the computed hash with the database hash. Are they equal? If they are equal, then there are very good chances that the password is correct. Otherwise, we are sure that the password is not correct. So we should just compare two strings. No, unfortunately, yes, but no. Because comparing two strings is an operation which, is, uh, which has a execution time proportional to the position of the first difference. 
If you have two strings and they differ in the first character, the comparison returns immediately. If the difference is that if all the characters are equal except the last one, the comparison takes longer. And so a bad guy could try to do many comparisons and according, there are crazy guy in the world I know, according to the time needed to give you the error, he could guess how much of the hash he could guess correctly. And so this, we are not using a normal comparison, we are using a special timing safe equal. So this method uh, is guaranteed to employ the same amount of time for every kind of equality or difference. So from the timing it, uh, it takes, uh, for the time it takes this method to run, we cannot know whether it was equal or different and how much it was different and, wh and whether it was the difference. Every step makes things more complex, but then the idea is that we have uh, this computed hash that is already, it's a, a sort of a binary array. And uh, we have the database hash that right now we decided to, st I stored it as a string, so we need to convert it to binary. Okay, we, these are 64 X digits that correspond to 32 bytes in binary. So the timing safe equal express uh, array buffer type array, that's a special data type for storing binary data, which are not strings. Okay, uh, and so it's this buffer from just to convert uh, from a string encoded in hexadecimal into um, a, a binary object. That timing safe equal can, can, can use. So in this case, if uh, the hashing algorithm didn't change overnight. Uh, week 13. If I know the, this test, uh, crypto test, it's telling me true. And uh, if I change the secret to something else, it should tell me false. And you see that the buffer I printed, which is the computation, the computed hash differs significantly from the previous one. And of course, from the one on the database. So this is the job of the verify function. How did I create these numbers? Okay. There wasn't any Uh, any relative coming in my dreams and telling me the numbers. Uh, I, we can use, uh, so let's say, in a, in a real application, we can use uh, this method random bytes to create the salt and then call the script with this salt we just generated and the real password. When you create a new user, you implement, you create a salt and use this salt for creating a new hash password and store both of them in the database. Uh, we are not implementing the registration information. It's not required in the exam to implement the registration of the users. So don't implement that. It's okay if you put the users by hand in the database. Okay? And so, but we not, so for doing this by hand, there's a nice website that I linked in the text of the exercise of this week here at the bottom. There are a website with three pages that basically call these functions for us. So the first one is uh, random x generates a random salt, a number. So let's say I want 16 digits to make it. And uh, generate, and it generates me some 16 digit salts. I pick one, every time they will be different, I pick one, and can, I can use, create a new user. Oh, so let's try to create a new user with ID three, with the mail uh, new user, and the salt is this one. And now we need to store the edge of the password for this guy 
we can go to the other page that it's listed here, a script, or we can write just three lines of JavaScript, it's the same. Uh, the salt is the same as before. The output could be, for example, 32. Usually we are, in the slides, there's a suggestion that the salt should be at least 16 and the password should be at least 32. And the password for this guy is a uh, password. Or one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and you call this, and we give you the hash. You copy the hash and store that into the database. Right now we created a new user. If we want to check if everything is okay, we can you know, modify our small test program. The password should be password. The salt of this new user is this one. The hash is here. And let's test uh, it's true. It's, if we modify the password, of course, it becomes false. Okay? So, creating some users by hand is quite easy. So remember every time to create a new salt and encrypt, just a, a matter of uh, being careful with the cut and paste. Okay, so all, we have all the ingredients. We need to start baking them into the project. Shall we take a break? Okay. <laughs>